Uh, these are palm leaf manuscripts. They are delicate, they are sometimes infested and rotten, uh, destroyed by insects, destroyed by humans even in uh, purges of uh, various times across uh, the centuries. But uh, as you can see, there are thousands of these here. These manuscript boxes were at one time introduced to save and preserve the manuscripts, but unfortunately uh, now many manuscripts have uh, been damaged because of the uh, art value of these boxes. So I've come here today to what kit because I wanted to show you uh, these manuscripts in the cabinet. Kopma Kap. Uh, these manuscripts in the cabinet at this temple, in this uh, museum, as an example uh, of what I want to talk about. It wasn't until around about 17 to 1800 that these manuscripts were starting to be compiled into something of a storyline and called a chronicle. Now these chronicles were then uh, becoming uh, you know, a, a storyline, a timeline of how things happened throughout a period of somebody's life. Not just the event that they attended, as in King Meng Rai, he did this on this particular day or this particular period, and that's the end of the story. Chronicles actually pieced together things that were, uh, you, know, you know, history of what he did. Now, it wasn't until the early 1900s uh, that the, um, the, the, the likes of these chronicles started to be recorded and taken seriously. And although some of them were copied of copies and some of them were incomplete because they didn't have the full set and that sort of thing, uh, Penn University uh, has over 6,000 um, microfiche uh, scanned documents uh, of northern Thailand. So as well as Penn uh, University in the States putting together these microfiche uh, uh, records, they've got uh, apparently 6,137 records of northern Thailand um, manuscripts uh, recorded so people can refer to them. But uh, Chiang Mai University and Lao uh, have a, um, a joint, um, what do you call it, uh, arrangement, uh, organisation to record and uh, preserve these as well. So there, there's an awful lot of work that's gone on, but it's in recent times. And uh, the fact that some of them are missing, there are holes in history. The fact that some of them are, have got no author, we don't know who did them, we don't know who copied them, we don't know whether there's a style of the, um, you know, the person who wrote the first one uh, actually was different to the next manuscript you read. Uh, the, the person was maybe, uh, you know, a different type of writer, maybe he had a different mindset. and. They weren't all compiled in the same detail, so it didn't have a subject line, um, paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three, uh, must include these items. It was a, you know, sometimes a flowery, sometimes not a flowery uh, depiction of their story of the event that happened on that occasion. Now, some time ago, I talked to you about a book I was looking for, and it was the Chiang Mai Chronicle. Well, that's the book that is really, really exciting me right now. I've been reading it for the last couple of months and trying to put together a story for you because side, uh, besides that, I've been reading the Wien Kum Kam uh, book and I've been taking you uh, through Wien Kum Kam and each of the uh, temples there. And in order to understand so much about Wien Kum Kam, I wanted to get underneath uh, the uh, the, the detail, into, right into the detail of the Chiang Mai Chronicles. When King Meng Rai left uh, Wien Kum Kam, he went out on his forays, and each of his forays are listed in the chronicle. They're fantastic. And on his final foray out from Wien Kum Kam, he found this wonderful place uh, that had a, an opening. It was within a you know, grand forest area, and there was a clearing. And in this clearing, he saw two white albino deer, a, apparently a, a female and her, her, her fawn. And along came some wolves and the wolves chased the deer and they ran into the forest. Well, the, the wolves were dumbstruck. 
that's not the words that I used, uh, and the deer came back out and they survived. And King Meng Rai thought so, so much of this, how clever the deer were, that he thought this is a very special place. And he thought this would be the place he needed to set up his new administration, his new home, his palace, and indeed he would build a city here called Chiang Mai. So on this plinth we see uh, it written in English, the sacred elephant encircled stupa in 1295. King Meng Rai from Chiang Rai, King Ngam Muang from Paiyao, and King Ruang from Sukhothai built a royal residence and sleeping quarters at this site and began construction of Wat Chiang Man. At the same time, they also began construction of the new city, Chiang Mai. When the temple and the city were fully completed, they constructed this chedi, stupa, where the royal residence and sleeping quarters had been and enshrined a sacred hair relic of the Buddha inside the stupa. I've come here to Wat Chiang Man because I want to... Um, I want to use an example, for instance, of how uh, the manuscripts that were written 700 years ago uh, were then passed down the ages and then finally compiled into a magnificent book such as the Chiang Mai Chronicle. Now, apparently, when he built his palace here, he designated an area over there which is around the Mare Car, and we know about the Mare Car, we've been around the Mare Car recently. Uh, that's where he decided that uh, it was boggy and moist enough for cattle to graze, elephants to graze, and uh, to keep all his uh, livestock. That is mentioned in these chronicles. So once again, it's important to understand the little details that the chronicles are giving us. Anyway, I'm gonna to go to another place now and show you a, another snippet of a chronicle, uh, part of the chronicle, which was included in some manuscripts that were compiled. Um, if you can join me and understand this, I hope you appreciate it as much as I do. If I'm boring the socks off of you, see you in the next video. Well, this is site number 18, and it's uh, actually called Wat Chang Cam uh, in today's money. Uh, but uh, I am showing you right now uh, the new part of this uh, site. But I actually want to talk to you uh, about the old part. Now, walking along this pathway here, um, it actually divides the new from the old and over here we have uh, this very small and very unusual building uh, unusual because of the porchway that's here uh, the intricate carvings of wood and although it's been restored many times and therefore replicated and replaced and replaced and replaced uh, in over the 700 years, apparently this was built in 1291 AD. The Chorfar that you see up here, uh, this is Chorfar, uh, are elephant's head with uh, tusks and the uh, pigeon looking over the top at us, uh, the uh, trunks and the elephant's head there, and the other unusual wood carvings that uh, are in the in the eaves here. Rather intricate. And Gary Harbottle, in his book, he says that um, immediately north of the center of the ruins is a small building fully restored many times with exquisite external wood carving, very short planak, which is the staircase here. Um, this is the Naga uh, staircase and uh, the balustrade and curious elephant headed Naga style shofar, uh, chofar, chofar, and uh, gale to the gables. It was built in 1291, and uh, this was when Meng Rai was here. Could this be the sleeping hall he promised the Lankan monks? Well, I want to talk to you about the Lankan monks. These are the Sri Lankan monks. Uh, they have got a, a lot to do with what went on here as well as uh, King Meng Rai, as well as his wife. 
Well, many of you will have seen in my videos over the last few months um, the amount of detail I go into from Gary Harbottle Johnson's book, uh, talking about uh, what he is explaining uh, uh, the, the temples today to be, albeit 20 years ago, and talking about the construction and s actually introducing some of the history behind them. Well, in picking up the uh, Chiang Mai Chronicle book, um, I have now gone down so many rabbit holes. I'm excited to tell you because I enjoy going down rabbit holes. I, I, it's something that's fascinating to actually follow, um, you know, the path of a piece of information. You pick up a little piece of information and you think, what, well, where's that going? And then you chase it down. The Chiang Mai Chronicle uh, starts talking about uh, the rulers of Chiang Mai uh, from a perspective of hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, with the rulers of India. And mythical or real, we must believe, we must take for granted, it's in writing, it is followed and understood and taught that King Mengrai was the 24th descendant of the first king of Lana who came down a silver ladder from a cloud on the instruction of kings of Jambu, which was the Indian subcontinent area, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Now, this descent from the clouds on a silver ladder was purported to have happened in uh, the area of Doi Tung, and that is up in Chiang Rai. It's also the place where the late king's mother, uh, God rest her soul, actually ended uh, her final years. It's also near Chiang San, which is on the border of Laos and Burma, the Golden Triangle. And it is from there that we then learn that Meng Rai came down to the south of Chiang San, Chiang Rai, and into Hari Punchai. And there are lots of stories in uh, the chronicles about how he overcame Hari Punchai. Lampun as we know it today. He then spent five years there. He came to Wien Kum Kham, spent five years here. He then went on to Chiang Mai and founded Chiang Mai. So all of that we have read and understood from the chronicles, uh, these uh, details, this rabbit hole uh, of King Meng Rai from Chiang Mai coming backwards, Wien Kum Kham, Lampun, Hari Pun Chai, Chiang Rai, Chiang San, we are only bound to believe the mystical, apparently factual, descent from the clouds by a silver ladder. One could say anecdotes, but they are stories, tales from over 700 years ago, uh, told by people, some of the uh, uh, writings, we don't know who made them. We don't know uh, as to how long after uh, the events uh, some of them were made, but uh, they are believed by uh, many to be true uh, records of how people thought uh, about things that happened back then uh, and through the ages. Now, the manuscripts uh, tell us so many things about uh, what happened here. Uh, and today, what I want to do is tell you a couple, just a couple. Uh, I'm not going to bore the pants off you today. Uh, this video is part one, and in the second part, I'll give you some more of the background. Predominantly, I want to talk about uh, King Mengrai and this temple, because King Mengrai 
uh, actually came here in 1290 to an already established temple. And at that time, uh, the temple... Now, I, I want to actually um, just preface this by saying, um, when in Thai this is, in Thai language, when something floods, it's called tuam. Uh, so therefore, when you have nam tuam, it's a flood. Well, the temple name here, uh, 700 plus years ago, was called Wat Kat Tuam. Well, this is the wonderful Chiang Mai Chronicle 2nd edition uh, by David K. Wyatt and Arun Rat uh, Um In, uh, I mean, there's, there's so much here to talk to you about, but uh, I want to bring you to uh, the... I actually want to talk to you about this, actually. It's so fascinating, the lineage of uh, King uh, Laurawankawat. But uh, today, I want to talk to you about this place that we've come to, and this is what cat to him. When King Mengrai came here, uh, he uh, came and saw a large tree in the middle here. Uh, the buildings uh, that are here uh, right now that have been uh, lost to time, they were not there. And uh, the uh, huge stupa behind me, that was not there either. Uh, the buildings over on the far side here are relatively new. But there was a temple here, and it was called, as I say, Wat Kat Tuam. Now, the tree, I make mention of the tree. This tree is a Bodhi tree, and the history has it that before this Bodhi tree, there was a huge Sapan tree. Now, this Sapan was revered by people in the local area. They would come here and they would make offerings they would uh, you know, light candles and they would bring gifts and uh, pour water uh, on occasions. They would do things in a uh, traditional sense at the tree that was here because they revere the tree. Not just because of the tree, but because in the tree was a sok sawat. And sok sawat means uh, a, uh, a Sylvian sprite. Now, a, a sprite is a, a fairy type um, a creature, but in this case, it uh, revealed itself as an albino water monitor, a monitor lizard. Now, you know, this, this is from the Chronicles. This is not written on bits of paper around here or, you know, just handed down through word of mouth here. Not just that, it's in the Chronicles. It's in the manuscripts that were kept from hundreds of years ago. And it's those little things that are so fascinating. Now that tree died. When Ming Rai was here, he was building the Wiang. He was creating the city, uh, the fortified Wiang city of Wiang Kum Kham. And because the tree died, people were very emotional, they were very upset. And there were five, I want to say the word monks, because I can't pronounce the word uh, that re relates to these um, monks, uh, practicing Buddhism. They were here and they said prayers for the people. They wanted to give them some solace, but also they wanted to uh, pay respects to the tree. And they also told King Mengrai a very important story. And I'm saying important because I think this has uh, a, a lot to do with how uh, we understand um, culture today. Uh, because there is symbolism in this story that goes back over 700 years now, 720 plus years, um, that when King Meng Rai heard of a story from these monks about a king who had a relic of a Buddha statue, it gave him powers. Well, obviously his ears pricked up and he immediately instructed his chief carpenter his construction guy to carve five statues and he wanted them life-size and he said he's going to raise an army he's going to go off and have a war and then if his um, opponent 
uh, relinquish his um, power, Meng Rai would come back here and build a vihan, a vihara, a temple to actually house those statues in. So what this is actually doing now is talking about um, making an offering, making good. And if then something good comes from that, then it is seen as merit, it is seen as a success and therefore good luck. And then you then want to do it again. You want then to develop this chain of if I give, then I get, then I give again. So King Mengrai, he gets an army together. He takes his men over to Pegu uh, in Burma, uh, which was at that time one of the capitals of the area. His envoys and the king of Pegu's envoys met. You know, you can imagine these televised, um, you know, Viking uh, uh, crusades uh, where they have a tent and they sit in the tent and they talk about things and they drink, you know, drink and they, you know, talk and they shout and they all do it very pleasantly. Well, that happened in, you know, Pegu. And King Meng Rai's envoys said, what does the king of Pegu hold most dearly? What does the king of Pegu hold over and above all else? What is the most important thing? Well, the envoys went away and huddled in the corner and thought, well, what is it? Well, you know, what, these, what, are they, what do these people want? And they came back and they said, well, it's the princess. It's the um, precious daughter of the king. She is the most uh, valued uh, commodity, uh, thing, that um, the king of Pegu holds dearest. The king of Pegu gave the daughter to Meng Rai. He gave 500 families and all of uh, the uh, elephants and horses uh, that were needed. And King Meng Rai came back to Wien Kum Kam. Now, on the return from uh, Pegu uh, with his Paiko, uh, Princess Paiko, uh, Queen Paiko, uh, by his side, he returned to this, this Wien Kum Kam and instructed his carpenter to now build the Vahan, the temple, uh, to place the carved, the five carved. Buddha statues, and it's this structure that's here now. Now this structure is only round about uh, you know half a half a meter, meter at places, meter and a half is the highest over there. Uh, this was built in 1290, 1291-ish, uh, um, and the, it was built by the carpenter whose name was Mr. Kun uh, Kan Tom. Now, Kan Tom, uh, he uh, is the guy that then gave his name to this temple. Today, the temple is, uh, is known by a third name, uh, and this is known as Chiang Kam, and Chiang Kam is relating to uh, caring for elephants. And uh, the statues we see here are including elephants, and it's explained over here uh, a little bit about uh, the old um, temple, but by no means does it explain what we know are in the chronicles, in the manuscripts. Over here, for instance, it says, what can Tom? Uh, this temple consists of Vihara facing west and a Mandapa, which connected to the back of the Vihara, houses of Buddha image. The Yonok chronicles and if you read Yonok, you read Chiang Mai Chronicles as well, uh, notes that King Mengrai built Wat Kan Tom in 1290. There is a chedi, the basement of which is 12 metres wide and 18 metres high. The chedi has a double niches in each direction. The lower niche contains four seated Buddha image and the upper one enshrines a standing Buddha image. There are also two followers of the Buddha 
Mokalana and Sarabutra, Indra and Nang Torani, or the Mother of Earth. In the area of the temple, there is a Maha Poti uh, from the Lanka in the period of King Mengrai. Uh, this is Maha Potri, Potri, and this is talking about the tree that I want to talk to you about in the next video. Other important archaeological evidences are Hari Punchai Buddha tablets and a red sandstone inscription. There are three kinds of alphabets used on the inscription. Mon dating back to 127 through to 137. Mon and Tai about 1277-1317. And Sukhothai, early Fakam of Lana, and that's dated around 1397. And the Department of Fine Arts excavated this restored this in 18, 1984. Well, I hope you appreciate that if I just read that sign there and pointed you at this tree and then at this wonderful building here, which apparently uh, today still holds the spirit of King Menrai, and uh, maybe show you the old temple building here uh, that uh, was excavated, maybe it would give you a sense of there's some history here, but you'd want more. And I'm hoping that these videos and the digging and diving and the links to uh, the chronicles and therefore the manuscripts will give you some uh, assistance to go off and do your own uh, homework too and find out more, more than I can explain to you. It, it's a fantastic history here and, and I want to talk to you more about it. So hopefully uh, you'll come back for the next video and uh, I'll talk more about the history of this area. Take care, see you in that video. Bye-bye.